Matt, good to talk to you again. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Matt. Great to be with you. So it's been kind of a whirlwind tour, um, and I, it looks like uh, most of your book tour has actually been live in person as opposed to remote, like your last book tour. Uh, well, uh, the yeah, the, I brought out a book in 2020 called How Innovation Works, and I wasn't able to go on tour at all, of course, for that. I eventually ended up doing a belated tour in Texas uh, for that book just a week before this new book came out. <laughs> so uh, and I've, not, I've not written two books in two years before, so this is an unusual um, uh, turnaround for me. Yeah, I looked it up, and you were actually on this show about exactly a year ago promoting that last book. So it's uh, I, I, envy your right. product, I envy your productivity, but maybe the lockdown itself had something to do with that. It certainly did. You yeah. know, a, lot, a lot fewer parties to go to. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was, and, and maybe that's a good thing in and of itself. Um, so the, the book we're talking about today, and I want everybody to get this book because I, I found it honestly um, a substantial but easy to understand for the layperson explanation of all of these debates that we're having about the origins of COVID. Um, and I've, I found myself having to become an amateur expert on these subjects because it um, since the beginning of the lockdown, um, the reaction, the government response to the lockdown has very much gotten into um, my business, which is economics and 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 how we how we keep people fed and and these these other important issues that that a lot of epidemiologists don't seem to care that much about. But the book is called Viral: The Search for the Origins of COVID-19. And um, talk a little bit about your co-author, Dr. Alina Chan, because I discovered her independent of you, like I think a lot of people did because she was offering me so, some helpful explanations as to as to why maybe the the wet market story about the vi the virus didn't make perfect sense. Yeah, well I first came across her when I read a paper that she and two colleagues had written saying that this virus seems to be surprisingly well adapted from the start to infecting human cells unlike the SARS virus. Uh, it's not genetically evolving as fast as you would expect in the early years, early months of an epidemic. And I contacted the authors of the paper. Uh, I got a very, very interesting reply from uh, Alina Chan. And um, uh, it was around that time that the Chinese authorities announced that they didn't think the wildlife market in Wuhan was anything other than a super spreader event. They couldn't find any infected animals there, so it was likely that what happened is that people infected each other in that setting. And uh, so both these things uh, came together in my mind to make me think, well, hang on, maybe I've a bit, been a bit hasty in dismissing the uh, theory that it came from a lab leak and uh, just because uh, virologists have told me to dismiss it, went back and looked at their arguments, realized actually they were very weak arguments. So I began to get interested. And Alina Chan turned out to be a 32-year-old uh, postdoc at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT, um, a terrific genomics expert, unbelievably energetic and indefatigable in terms of going through documents and looking up stuff. And around the same time that this was happening to me, she was getting more and more intrigued in this question, and she felt it was an important question needed looking into. I came to rely on her uh, very heavily in terms of judging whether a piece of information was good or bad, whether it was reliable or not reliable, um, uh, whether it was important. And eventually, I, I began to decide that somebody needed to do a book-length treatment of this topic, because there's no way you can cover all the strands in either a tutorial or a, even an essay or an article uh, that needed to be a book. Um, and I took a chance and I wrote to this brilliant young postdoc and said, do you fancy being a co-author? I've never written a book with someone else before. We're on the opposite sides of the Atlantic. We've never met. Won't be easy, but I think it would be worth it. And to her I, I mean, she was mad to say yes, but she did. <laughs> and um, uh, less about a year later, here we are. We've we finished. I, I wrote the first draft. She wrote the second draft. Um, we then wrote a couple more drafts each. You know, there was a lot of to and fro, a huge amount of sharing of information and data, and uh, you know, arguing over 
words and paragraphs and uh, eventually uh, we got the book out uh, just a couple of weeks ago and we met around the same time for the first time and it's been an, an absolutely wonderful experience except for the fact that it's about a really horrible thing which is millions yeah. of people dying as a result of a dreadful virus spreading around the world so the um you know you said that she was mad to partner with you and i i, I know you were saying that as a joke but i also suspect that it's not a particularly uh wise thing for people in her field of inquiry to do right now because there does seem to be an almost monolithic enforcement of an official narrative when it comes to the origins of COVID and the treatment of COVID and and the demonization of of scientists that sort of deviate from that has she has she experienced that I mean I follow her on Twitter and I know she's she's one tough cookie but but I I, I imagine and I want to get into this more but I imagine that lots of financial incentives and professional incentives uh, push against anybody questioning the the official narrative. Yes, uh, Alina has come under enormous pressure from uh, senior um, scientists and virologists. Uh, she's uh, been subject to some pretty unpleasant criticism. Uh, there are, you know, some veiled threats that are really quite unfunny. Um, she and I are both mildly concerned about our own security, but I don't want to go into that for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, it, it, it's an unbelievably brave thing for a young scientist quite early in her career to to do but she just kept thinking i'm sorry this subject's too important to back off um uh, she wants to have a conventional scientific career and i'm sure she will have a brilliant one um but by the middle of this year you had a bunch of people who were still uh, trying to discredit her but you had another bunch of people who were inviting her to the top table to discuss this topic because they realized they couldn't leave her out. Um, and, the, you know, we're, we're beginning to uh, treat her as, as, as a senior uh, expert on this kind of stuff. Now, there's no such thing as an expert on the origin of COVID-19, if you see what I mean. You know, we're yeah. all scrambling to catch up. And some of us know more genomics or more virology or more epidemiology than others. But you, you need to know all of those things and a whole lot more to understand this topic. Uh, it's been a steep learning curve. But uh, I've known, uh, I mean, I, it's, it's incredibly impressive to me uh, what this person has achieved. And if they thought they could bully her into silence, they picked on the wrong woman. Yeah, it, it, uh, it, 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 it just dawned on me that it reminds me a little bit of some of the heroes in your last book, on innovation, pushing against the conventional wisdom, and and ultimately um, becoming almost heroic by by persisting against that, and and that that to me is like how science is supposed to be, right? Absolutely, uh, the, the uh, pretty well all great scientific ideas start out espoused by heretics who are persecuted for pursuing them. You know, Charles Darwin being an obvious one, um, uh, but. Uh, that doesn't mean that all heretics are geniuses, quite the reverse. You know, most of the mavericks who say they've got a brand new scientific idea are talking nonsense. So you do have to aim off for the fact that, uh, um, you know, not everybody who's a contrarian, who's pushing against conventional wisdom can be trusted. But nor can you afford to ignore every single one and just assume that conventional wisdom is correct. Um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, the the um, uh, it was Richard Feynman who said, uh, "Science is the belief in the ignorance of experts." Now that's going a little too far, but his point was the science, the the, the arbiters of science are the evidence, not the experts. I mean, if, you know, if I want an argument from authority, I'll join the Catholic Church. Yeah. Um, if I want an argument from evidence, I'll become a scientist. Yeah. Well, I, I watched, uh, I just watched your, your excellent conversation with my friend and colleague, Glenn Beck, and, and he pretty much goes through the chapters in the book. And I, 
I want to I want to explore some other ideas as well on this, and I would recommend everybody watch that um, either on YouTube or Blaze TV. Um, but let's uh, um, give us give us a summary of 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 the the progression of this book so people understand. And I, by the way, I want everyone to read this book and go on Amazon right now and and pick it up. Um, but it it reminds me kind of of, of a who done it. And uh, I don't know if you remember the book by Dan Brown, The Da Vinci Code. Um, and it's somewhere between The Da Vinci Code and maybe the new James Bond movie, No Time to Die, where he discovers this horrible um, clandestine conspiracy to release a, a deadly <laughs> virus on the world. Have you thought about who's going to play you in the movie? Like, is it is it Brad Pitt? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure I'm terribly keen on either of those analogies because they were both fictional and, and in the sure. case of the Da Vinci Code, a little bit far-fetched. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas we we have tried, we, I, I agree with you, we have ended up writing a bit of a detective story, um, but we didn't set out to do that. And we were very careful not to go into the sort of breathless narrative prose that you are sometimes tempted to do, to put into this uh, into this kind of book, you know, he was breathing heavily as he as he walked up the hill towards the back cave, you know, that sort of stuff, where you don't know that he was breathing heavily, you weren't there, you're just sort of making it up. Um, we didn't want to make anything up, we wanted to be able to back everything we set up with evidence. But it became clear as we were doing it, that what we had to do was just lay out stuff as we found it, as our sources found it, and try and sort of see where it took us and then say, oh, hang on, this took us to this. Let's see what we know about this and so on. And so step by step, we try to take the reader deeper and deeper into what we know about this virus, what we know about bat viruses in general, what we know about the Wuhan Institute of Virology or the wildlife trade to the wildlife market in Wuhan uh, and um, what's plausible and what's not. Uh, what we've got evidence for and what we haven't. You know, so for example, the notion that this came about as a result of a biological warfare program deliberately trying to make a weapon, uh, we think we can find no good evidence for that at all. It's possible, but it's there's, with, without good evidence, we don't think it's important to uh, take that one seriously. You know, so so we're trying to show the reader the dead ends as well as the intriguing trails so um the uh sorry my cat has joined and hopefully he didn't hang up our our show here i saw his you tail Summon siri <laughs> this is not helpful buddy <laughs> so i'm hoping by the way that my cat is not a carrier of some deadly virus at this point get down buddy um <laughs> We'll, we'll edit that out in post. Um, now I forget what I was talking about. So, so the uh, so let's you you started off as as a with a fairly conventional interpretation of the origins of the virus and with with a certain um, confidence that that the scientific community now knew enough about how to manage these types of viruses that this would be a, a flash in a pan and wouldn't ever uh, reach sort of the, the global and devastating status that it has today. Um, what what changed your mind as, as you were investigating that this, this is different? Yeah, but you're, you're right that I, I, I did say in my book, The Rational Optimist, 10 years ago that a pandemic might derail human progress. But I, I then later said, but our genomic knowledge is moving ahead so fast that we're going to be so much quicker onto the next one. SARS you know, nearly became a global pandemic, but didn't. We've now got far superior technology. I mean, in the case of SARS, it took months to, to sequence the genome. We didn't have ready PCR diagnostic testing available everywhere. Um, it took a long time to, to catch up with this virus, and yet we, we stopped SARS in its tracks. So how much more easy would it be to do that today? This is going to turn into a little local difficulty in China in the month, early months of 2020, I thought, and then we'll look back on it and learn a few lessons from it. Um, but uh, no, it escaped, it went global, it became a terrible pandemic, and it didn't matter how much we threw at it in terms of testing and isolation and so on, we still didn't seem to be able to stop the spread of it. And that's because it was very infectious from the start. 
infectious in a pre-symptomatic way, which is particularly dangerous in terms of being able to get a foothold in the population. Um, and uh, that's one of the features that is a bit surprising. If this thing has been spending half a million years infecting bats with their very different cells and their very different molecular receptors, how come on its first encounter with human beings, it can spread like wildfire through us. How come it uses the so-called ACE2 receptor on the surface of our respiratory cells uh, as if it has a key to that lock? Um, and that's one of the questions that Alina in particular asked early on. Why is this virus so well adapted to human beings? And it's one to which there is a very disturbing answer. And that is that the, the, the bat viruses that it's related to do not live near Wuhan. We know that. Bats have been tested around there. They live at least a 1,000 miles away, further south. But that there is one group of people who've been going deliberately to that area and collecting viruses from bats on a massive scale, thousands of viruses, and bringing them back to the city of Wuhan and nowhere else because Wuhan is the site of the largest bat SARS coronavirus research program in the world and the site of the largest database of these kinds of viruses in the world, the largest collection of samples of these kinds of viruses in the world. And they've been not only bringing them to the laboratory, they've been defrosting them, uh, trying to grow them in cells in the laboratory, manipulating their genes, swapping genes in and out of different ones to try to find out how dangerous they are and infecting them into human cells and then into humanized mice, mice carrying human ACE2 receptors. And this is a uh, program of work which was, you know, it had noble intentions. The plan was to, to get ahead of the next pandemic and predict it and avert it. Well, at the very least, it failed in that. It didn't help us predict this pandemic at all. Um, uh, and at worst, it might have been involved in causing it, because we know that accidents happen in these kind of labs all the time. SARS has leaked from labs at least four times. Why wouldn't SARS-CoV-2 do so if it was in a lab, given how infectious it is? So we know that um, you you refer to them as humanized mice, and and you you go in great detail with the converse in the book and with the conversation with Glenn. So I won't do that here. Um, that that is a fact. Uh, correct? Like, we, we know that that was happening. Yes, yes. Now, there are published papers from the Wuhan Institute of Virology saying uh, we have used these viruses to infect humanized mice. And there's one set of experiments they describe in collaboration with the EcoHealth Alliance in the United States, uh, in which they find that by swapping the spike genes or parts of the spike genes between viruses, they are able to generate a virus that has the backbone of the one they've been using all along, but the spike of another virus, also from a uh, bat in southern Yunnan. And that new virus, that chimera, as it's called, uh, is up to 10,000 times more capable of replicating in humanized mice. And it is um, uh, much more likely to kill the mice, obviously, as well. So, uh, you know, there is no question that a more dangerous virus was created or engineered during such an experiment, at least once, but probably several times. Yes, in, in Wuhan, is that? In is Wuhan, that, yeah, okay. no, this work was done in Wuhan. And is, is, is that what? Similar work's been done elsewhere, but sure. most of the work on this kind of SARS-like virus was done in Wuhan. Yeah, but, but relevant to where this virus emerged, um, which is why you focused on the Wuhan lab, correct? Right. I mean, you know, if um, uh, if if there's a lab studying a particular narrow type of disease in a particular city, and that city is the place where that disease breaks out, you know, if there's a smallpox lab um, in uh, I don't know, Atlanta, and uh, there's a smallpox outbreak in Atlanta, then you should be suspicious. It's not unreasonable. There was a there was an anthrax lab in Sverdlovsk in the Soviet Union. 
there was an anthrax outbreak in Sverdlovsk that killed 80 people in 1979. The Soviets said, and an international inquiry agreed with them, that it was nothing to do with the anthrax lab. And then the Soviet Union collapsed, and uh, some of the scientists came forward and said, actually, it was. We left the filter off the day before, and we know that we contaminated the local area with anthrax. So, um, you know, it's not unreasonable. Uh, I mean, I think John Stewart put it very well in, in a skit where he said, you know, Hershey, Pennsylvania is where they make chocolate. If a chocolate disease breaks out in Hershey, Pennsylvania, you don't just go, well, it's a coincidence. Are you disturbed that comedians make more sense than um, some of our most senior government healthcare officials on this subject? Well, I'm surprised by how many so-called expert people say to me, no, the reason they had a Wuhan Institute of Virology was because Wuhan's where these viruses live. And I can say, no, you haven't read the papers. They tested 10,000 bats in and around Wuhan, and they never found these kind of viruses. Whereas they, they, they did find them 1,885 kilometers away by road in a disused mine shaft, which they visited at least seven times to sample the bats and took, them, took the samples straight to Wuhan. So is there a difference between the uh, sort of viral manipulation you were describing in humanized mice and what we're debating in the United States, uh, so-called gain of function research that that sort of turns vi that would turn a virus into a super virus so that then you can then try to figure out how to stop it? Is, this, is it the same thing? Yes, it's part of the same question. The 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 semantic debate over what constitutes gain of function and what doesn't, which has become a very live issue in US politics, is one that I sometimes try and avoid because you know I don't have skin in the game, I'm not in the US, um, and I think the main issue here is what happened in China. But the main, the, the, the fact, whatever you want to call it, that viruses in the laboratory have been given the ability to be more infectious or more virulent deliberately that is happening in lots of labs around the country. About five or six years ago, there was a big debate about whether that was responsible research. It was called the gain of function debate. Um, it was it came about after two particular experiments with influenza that basically made them more capable of infecting mammals, which sounds more dangerous for human beings. Um, uh, and the, the justification for them was that we need to know how close these guys are to turning into dangerous viruses. If we find that it's just a couple of steps, then we need to be really alert. And yes, that is a justification for it. But whether or not this kind of experiment should not have been funded under the current regulations in, in place in the United States government funding, that's a slightly more difficult issue because on the whole, um, animal viruses were excluded projects that already started were excluded. And of course, the US has no jurisdiction over what happens in Wuhan or, or other parts of China. So um, the gain of function debate uh, can get very political, can get very bogged down. But yes, the kinds of experiments we're talking about having been done at the Wuhan Institute of Virology are by any reasonable definition, gain of function experiments, some of yeah. them, not all of them, of course. Yeah. And it's and that that is particularly relevant going back to one of the very first points you made, unlike uh, most viruses and, and maybe all modern viruses, isn't the, the whole point of your book is it's unusual that we don't know by now the origins of where right. this virus came from. And and to talk a little bit like um, we knew where SARS uh, where um, the last one came from. I'm, I'm now forgetting which one I'm talking about. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, people say, well, come on, we don't know where the 1918, flu, 1918 influenza came from. We don't know really where Ebola came from. Um, uh, it, we, we think we know something about where HIV came from, but it took us decades to find out. Yeah, but that was before we had PCR testing, uh, genomic knowledge, the ability to sequence the genomes of viruses on a massive scale, this kind of stuff, and therefore create the family trees and work out what the oldest strain is and things like that. In, in, the, in the last 20 years, we've been very quick to track down the origins of 
um, pandemics and epidemics. So SARS broke out in 2002-03. It quickly became apparent that the people getting infected were food handlers, were people who were either working in markets with wildlife or who were working in restaurants with, with the meat from wildlife. And it then quickly became apparent that some of the animals they were handling were infected. In this case, palm civets mainly, which are sort of cat-like animals that are used in southern China to make a particular kind of dish. And um, uh, so it, it, it took a couple of months to work that out. Here we are two years into the uh, SARS-CoV-2 epidemic, and we still haven't found an infected animal like the palm civet, and we still haven't found a pattern of infection in the early cases. There's another example, MERS, which is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is a very dangerous uh, coronavirus that was first identified in 2012 in Saudi Arabia and has since caused a number of small outbreaks, including one in South Korea, which was when a traveler came back from Arabia with the virus and infected other people. Um, and these outbreaks are always easy to trace. You can work out who was the first person to get it. In the case of MERS, we know that on the whole, people catch it from camels. Um, so camel farms in Saudi Arabia are where the, the index cases usually work. Now, it's a bat virus, like most of these coronaviruses. Uh, and uh, so somehow the camels are catching it from bats. We don't yet quite know how, but we have found relatives of it in bats. So, so tracing it back to the original bat is not necessarily easy, but picking up a pattern in the first human cases is usually very easy. The fact that we weren't able to do so in this case, with us infinitely superior technology than we had in the case of SARS, is a pretty big red flag that there's something not being shared here. That. I mean, that in and of itself is a red flag, but the reaction from, um, I'll call it, uh, you, you would never use this phrase, but I'll call it the pandemic industrial complex. And that's <laughs> that's being a little bit sarcastic, but it's this, this entire massive ecosystem that perhaps has grown quite large in the last 20 years, where you have uh, NGOs and, and scientific researchers, um, corporations like pharmaceutical companies, and, um, you know, People that sit on tops of large piles of money, like Anthony Fauci at the NIH, it strikes me that, um, first of all, I, I, I as, as someone that doesn't know anything, I find the idea that we were purposefully uh, super engineering viruses to be kind of an insane thing to do. Um, but it, it's, it, it surely started off as a, as a good intentioned way to keep us safe. But there's also like, a financial incentive, as, as as Peter Daszak at Eco Health Alliance has proven, like if you're raising tons of money to do this stuff, let's do more. And sometimes, what more is seems super dangerous and not in the public health. You're absolutely right. I mean, Peter Daszak effectively took over a, a, a small and rather sleepy wildlife charity, and saw the opportunity. He's he's a He's an entrepreneur. He's a grand entrepreneur, if you like the, the, the expression. Saw so the opportunity in the wake of SARS and Ebola. There was a lot more money going into this kind of work, and within um, a few years, he had grown the annual budget of this organization to 17 million dollars, um, which is money that the U.S. government, on the whole, was giving partly through the Pentagon, partly through the National Institutes of Health, and partly through uh, the uh, uh, Overseas Development. Uh, uh, projects uh, and that w that money was then distributed to um, research partners around the world, of which the most prominent was the Wuhan Institute of Virology, where Xi Jinping became one of the biggest grant recipients of of money from the um, uh, uh, Eco Health Alliance uh, and became a great friend of of Peter Daszak's. So it's not in Peter Daszak's interest, um, financial or emotional or psychological to want to find out, uh, to, to, you know, to, to think that this came as, out as a result of, of the research they had been funding. Um, and that's very clear. And yet when he orchestrated a letter to the Lancet in February 2020, when the pandemic was about a month old, saying we can definitively rule out any lab-based origin, um, he also added, that he declared no competing interest. 
Now, that doesn't seem to me uh, to be the way scientists should be behaving. Remember, I'm saying this as a huge fan of science. I'm a science groupie. I've spent my whole career writing about how wonderful science is, how, the, how fantastic it is to discover things, how great scientists are. I wrote a biography of Francis Crick, one of my heroes, you know, who, who was the man behind the whole story of genomics, uh, as it were. And uh, so I want this stuff to be um, heroic and good, but that's why it's all the more annoying when you find scientists behaving in a way that can tarnish the reputation of the entire field. Well, I, I have this wild theory that sometimes government involvement screws up the most beautiful things. So maybe <laughs> maybe that's possibly the case here. And, and this is like, I, I want to go to uh, the C word, conspiracy. And when I use this word, I use it much more in the way that Adam Smith does in the wealth of nations of the natural proclivities of, of businessmen to conspire to, to fix prices. And, and also perhaps in the context of James Buchanan and public choice and, and the natural self-interest of government officials, that is a big reason why you and I are, are libertarians. We, we understand yeah. that incentives um, create uh, really bizarre outcomes in this case. So I think uh, Peter Daszak is is a glaring example of this, of a very self-interested guy who tried to divert attention um, and, and accuse anyone discussing a potential lab leak as a conspiracy theorist. Um, well, he's he's the conspirator in this story, and and he is just acting in his own financial interests. And I think I think the the boom in in federal funding of this kind of research creates all sorts of problems for science and truth seeking, and and perhaps um, from my point of view is is creating dangerous unscientific outcomes. I don't know how far will you go on that stuff. Well, I want to be careful not to uh, overclaim here because I I think you know it's important to try and. Uh, and understand what's going on rather than um, uh, accuse people too much. Um, uh, and it, it, it's important to bear in mind, I think, that people do self-deceive. They, you know, they, they don't, they don't sit there and think, "Oh, I'm going to make money if I do this. Therefore, I'd like to do this." They, they become emotionally committed to something, and they look for evidence that supports it, and they don't listen to people who produce evidence against it. And so they get into an echo chamber and a sort of spiral of self-justification. Um, we'll do it to some extent, um, uh, which was why it was, you know, really hard in this book to keep saying to ourselves, let's give both sides of the argument. And towards the end of the book, we give, we give as strong a case as we can that it's not a lab leak, that it's a market uh, event. And then as strong a case as we can that it is a lab leak. You know, we, we pretend we're an attorney facing a jury, summing up a case in as strong a way as we can. And, you know, I can read those two chapters and convince myself of either way, actually, while reading them. You know, so it's, it's, it, it, it's important to try and remain open-minded like that. Um, uh, Peter Daszak and his colleagues did set out with good intentions. You know, nobody is accusing them of, you know, trying to start a pandemic. Um, at least I'm certainly not. Um, and yet it's possible that getting deeper and deeper into funding this work because it's possible and seeing the 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 the, the prizes that might await you, you know, it, just imagine if you predicted which virus would cause a pandemic, caught it in the act of starting a pandemic and stopped it with a vaccine of your own design, you would get the Nobel Prize. You know, it's a fantastic achievement. Um, so the temptation to just help it start that pandemic and then stop it is there. I'm not saying that's what happened. I don't necessarily think it is what happened. But you can see how corrupting this kind of work can be inevitably and, and with everybody. And there's been a huge closing of the ranks uh, in virology, including some people who a few years ago were criticizing this work and saying this isn't going to work. You're not going to be able to predict the next pandemic with this. 
Um, you're not going to be able to avert it. You're certainly not going to be able to stop it. And uh, there are better ways of spending money on pandemic preparedness than going out and collecting viruses in the wild and bringing them back to labs. Now, those people were saying that very, you know, they got in some quite big rows. There was a big exchange between um, one group and Peter Daszak on, on that. We, we recount it in the book. Uh, but those people are now closing ranks with Peter Daszak saying, no, no, but it couldn't, this, 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 this isn't as a result of that. Well, I'm sorry, but, you know, it, it's not a case that scientists own this topic. You know, the rest of us own this topic too. You know, we've all had to live with the consequences of this virus too. We're allowed an opinion. We're allowed to see the evidence. And this idea that leave it to us, the experts, we know what we're talking about. You know, Peter Daszak has explicitly said on a number of occasions, yes, I've worked closely with the Wuhan Institute of Virology scientists. Yes, they're friends. That's exactly why you should trust me to go and research the origin on behalf yeah. of the World Health Organization. It, it strikes me that, and, and this gets to an obsession I've had for a long time, going back to when I worked on Capitol Hill during the Republican Revolution, there was this almost religious faith in scientific research. Therefore, the government had to dramatically increase the investment in scientific research. And it struck me, it strikes me that, that all these decades later, we've essentially created a cartel where even if Anthony Fauci and the NIH are only um, some percentage of your funding, it still probably emerges as a, as a good housekeeping seal of approval, a signal to everybody else that that is a legitimate source of investment. And, and the result of that is there's only one paradigm allowed. It's the one that's funded. And I feel like that's kind of what we're looking at now. They're, they're circling the wagons because they all have the same funding sources and they can't possibly deviate from that story. Uh, this is a common problem in science. This doesn't just happen in virology. It happens in, in a lot of areas uh, through the peer review system where, where basically it's, it's more like PAL review. You know, you, 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 you give your chums grants and you deny grants to people you don't agree with and don't like. And the more power you get, the more you can do that. Um, now, you know, I'm not saying anything new there. We all knew that was a problem before this pandemic. Um, scientists admit that's that's a problem, uh, but they uh, also, you know, they need to keep out the absolute nutters. You know, you don't want to um, give a grant to a man who says he can prove that the moon is made of cheese um, uh, because it's a waste of money. But at the same time, you end up turning your back on, ignoring people who have a slightly different angle. You know, if you take the case of uh, Barry Marshall, a, a, an Australian scientist who said to the world authorities on stomach ulcers, I think you're reading this all wrong. I think all the enormously lucrative drugs you've developed uh, based on the theory that it's caused by excess acid in the stomach are wrong. And I think that it's caused by a bacterium stomach ulcer is caused by a bacterium called Helicobacter pylori. Um, please give me a grant to investigate this possibility. He was, you know, drummed out of polite society at uh, ulcer, ulcer, ulcer conferences and things like that. You know, he was given no grants and blah, blah, blah. And he eventually had to resort to self-experimentation. He swallowed a flask of Helicobacter pylori, got excruciatingly painful stomach ulcers, swallowed a glass of antibiotics and cured them. And he then managed to persuade someone to let him do this experiment with other people. And eventually the world sat up and took notice, but not before he, you know, his heretical stuff ran into enormous resistance. And, you know, there's a, there are drug companies involved here making gazillions out of um, anti ulcer drugs, whose income streams pretty well dried up overnight. So they did not want to hear this. Something similar has been happening in Alzheimer's research recently, where you know one theory, the, the the plaque theory, has been dominant, and others who've said no, I think that's a symptom, not a cause of this disease, uh, were simply not allowed to 
um, get any of the money or any of the attention or any of the spots in the journals or at the conferences. So it is a problem. Science does become a priesthood very easily. It becomes dogmatic. The way it keeps honest is by having different centers. Science has accidentally become a very dispersed and fragmented thing that happens in lots of different universities around the country. Uh, and that way, Professor A challenges Professor B um, and says, I think you're talking complete nonsense. Um, and eventually he gets to make his point. So what spooks me is when scientists, wherever they're based, all start um, drinking from the same trough echoing the same uh, stuff and insisting on what they call a consensus. Well, it, this reminds me of uh, a now somewhat infamous defense that Anthony Fauci used. I think the second time that, that Rand Paul sort of beat him up a little bit in a Senate hearing where he's, he's backed into a corner, I think he's on CNN, and he says, um, frankly, any criticism of me is an attack on science itself. And that, yes. that would be sort of the apex of the high priesthood version of science. And it's, it's, it's fundamentally anti-science because science is, I think it should be based on, on humility, questioning, experimentation, and competition, as you've laid out in numerous of your books. And, and now it's like any question is, is, is heresy. I can't remember if it was in this interview or my previous interview where I quoted Richard Feynman to this that affected. I, was, was that just a few minutes ago or is that an hour ago? And I can't remember. Uh, but well, <laughs> if, if it was, do it again. I'll do it good. Uh, well, Richard Feynman said science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. Yeah. Now, that's arguably going a little bit too far. But, uh, but what he's saying is that uh, the arbiter of whether something is true in science is the evidence, not the expert. Um, if I want to uh, use arguments from authority, this guy has the right credentials, this guy is senior to me, this guy knows what he's talking about, um, therefore he's correct. If I want to use those arguments, I'll join the Catholic Church, frankly, because that's the way that's set up. But yeah. if I want to use the argument, um, I don't care how senior he is, I don't care how smart he is, uh, I don't care how many friends he's got, um, the evidence suggests he's wrong, the evidence suggests he's wrong, not I suggest he's wrong, the evidence suggests he's wrong, yeah. then that's science. So I want to I want to um, visit um, a term that that you surely know well, uh, scientism, and particularly Hayek's critique of the misapplication of, of the practices of the natural sciences in the sciences based on human action. And, and it strikes me that this virus in a fundamental way has sort of blurred the line between between these two practices and perhaps there was never a bright line between uh, so-called science and and uh, I'll call it politics, but I don't mean voting for people. I mean public policy and, and government responses to things. And I'm, I'm, I want to go back to something that you did that was quite heroic. You're you're a member of the House of Lords and um, um, to me, that's sort of like the Senate. I know it's fundamentally different, but for Americans who don't know what the House of Lords is, that, that sort of makes you the Rand Paul of, of the UK. I don't know if you like that comparison or not. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, Rand Paul has a much bigger salary, a much bigger budget, and, and much more power than, than I have. The, 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 there, are, there are many more lords with much less power. So it's, it's, a, it's a great big sort of think tank stroke committee, the House of Lords. But you had a chance, uh, like like Rand Paul has had a chance to question Anthony Fauci. You had a chance to question Neil Ferguson, um, and yes, people I that did. watch, yeah, people that watch my show. I've I've spent a lot of time talking about the Imperial College model, um, but it's like one thing I learned from uh, um, somebody else was that Neil Ferguson is not an epidemiologist, although he claims to be. He's a physicist, and it strikes me that many aspects of of the Imperial College model looked more like um, an experiment in, in, in physics than it did in, in virology or human action. Yeah, my, I have a big problem with modeling generally. I think modeling as a branch of science has been overclaiming uh, for years, not just in epidemiology, but in economics, uh, in uh, climate, in lots of areas. Uh, you know, there's lots of good science in these areas. There's lots of good data collection and analysis, but 
the the, the 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 fitting of a model, um, trying to describe in mathematical terms what's happening within a complex system uh, is a very tempting and enjoyable thing to do. And sometimes it's illuminating. But when you use it to forecast what's going to happen next, you nearly always fall flat on your face, in my view. And that's because these systems are much too complicated to um, uh, to to be boiled down to mathematical formulas. And I've seen this all my life, actually, ever since I was in research myself, where even in evolutionary biology, there were, there were a lot of people very interested in, in, in making models of what was happening. And I felt that they weren't understanding biology properly. They were, they were, they were being too mathematical and not biological enough. Um, uh, someone once said that, Biology is the science of exceptions, not rules. And, and there's this tendency among physicists and mathematics to say, we can come up with a golden rule that, that describes what's happening or a formula that will enable us to predict what happens next. And they nearly always get things wrong. For me, the pandemic has shown how wrong modeling can be. Very often, they've produced alarming uh, predictions of increases in cases that have not materialized. And sometimes they've produced um, reassuring predictions of declines in cases that also have not materialized. They didn't see the second wave coming uh, in the winter. They did see um, a, a wave coming last autumn, you know, uh, that kind of thing, So, um, which didn't. So uh, I, I am very critical of, model, of, of placing too much faith in models. Uh, and, you know, when, when it goes wrong, you often hear these post hoc excuses for the failure of models like, well, yeah, but that's because, you know, something changed. Exactly. That's the whole point. Things yeah. change in the world. Well, one of Neil Ferguson's assumptions was that that people wouldn't change in the face of a radically uncertain situation and a novel virus, which which seemed absurd on its face. Um, yeah. But you know, why did well, my, people my buy into those? My conversation with Neil was about whether or not he'd ever done, um, made a prediction about uh, Swedish numbers, um, and he flatly denied it. Well, we've got good evidence that they did actually generate predictions for Sweden uh, with their mathematical models, and they, and even other Swedish teams, took their mathematical models, adapted them to Sweden, and produced uh, model predictions from that. So. Um, uh, I feel I did win that argument on on the basis of facts, um, but uh, you know I don't hold it against him, and I'm, I hope he doesn't hold it against me. But you know we do need to be clear um, yeah. what, the, what the what the evidence is. Well, it get, it gets back to this like I would assume that there's a financial incentive to imagine a viral apocalypse because the the funding flows, and and it, it gets back to perhaps. Um, we've overbuilt this pandemic response to the point where something went horribly wrong. Um, I'm I'm quite suspicious of of people that are like Neil Ferguson who are constantly modeling an apocalypse and then and then sort of cherry picking um, the results to get those headlines. I mean, he's he's a serial uh, freakout guy when it comes to this stuff. Well, as you know, I wrote a book 10 years ago called The Rational Optimist, which was based on my own experience to some degree of being heavily influenced by pessimists in the 1970s who told me that the future was bleak in all sorts of different ways and never told me that it might be non-bleak. And then when I found out that it was non-bleak, it was actually a terrific few decades for humanity, for poverty, child mortality, disease, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, it left me wondering why everyone is so pessimistic all the time about the future. We're very happy to admit that things have got better in the past, but we always think we're part of the generation where it's about to start getting worse. We said that in the 70s. We said it in the 1830s. You know, I, I found these quotes from Thomas Babington Macaulay making this point uh, 170 years ago. Um, so uh, I do um, strongly think that there is a tendency to uh, give back, to make uh, gloomy prognostications because you sound wise, you get more airtime, you get more money. Um, it, it, there's always rewards for pessimism. There's never rewards for for optimism. Well, maybe in some corners of the stock market, but but otherwise, there's never rewards for, for optimism. And uh, th this 
has obviously been seized on here. Now, people say, well, look, here's a pandemic. It's killing millions. You were wrong to be blasé about this possibility. Um, and uh, I, yes, would like to know, you know, yes, I was wrong. I, it, I didn't see this coming. But if it turns out that this was caused by our pessimism, you know, we were so pessimistic about the possibility of a pandemic that we started doing things that weren't sensible or wise, then we need to know that. I mean, that's not an argument I use for why I'm looking into a lab leak. It only occurred to me in recent days, actually, that argument. But I think it is a relevant point, um, you know, that this, this, this pandemic might end up proving that we've been too pessimistic, you know, that these kind of pandemics can't get started without someone juicing up one of these things in the lab first. Yeah, it's a profound point. Um, I was thinking about, um, I don't think I've mentioned this yet, but I, I started rethinking uh, Hayek's book, The Counter-Revolution of Science, and, and particularly his critique of Henry de Saint-Simon, who is amongst many other things considered uh, the founding father of what would become socialism. Um, but Hayek takes this uncharacteristic, um, uh, very derisive tone, which is very unlike him in that book, and it always mystified me. But I was thinking about it again in the context of what you call the high church of science, um, because St. Simone's original vision of socialism was to put engineers and physicists and and all of the the hard scientists that he was fascinated with in the context of, of the, the French Enlightenment, um, he wanted to give them the power to reorganize society from the top down um, because they were smarter than the rest of us. And, and we all know that that has tragic consequences, but it strikes me that um, in the last 24 months, we've given way too much authority, if not explicit power, but um, the two seem to go together in, in, in governance to, um, scientists, epidemiologists, who may know a lot about their field, but but don't know anything about the unintended consequences of things like lockdowns and 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 stay at home orders and and the devastating effects of of putting in our country six trillion dollars into the economy. These are these are not unrelated to human health, um, but it it strikes me that that all the power is in the hands of the of the epidemiologists today. Uh, I do agree with you on on some of that. I think the the phrase that was being used in the UK at the start is we are following the science um, is a little dangerous because there's no th such thing as the science, particularly in a brand new pandemic caused by an organism that we don't fully understand yet. Uh, and so we had the ridiculous situation where um, the official advice was that masks were useless and then the official advice was that masks were good. The official um, policy was that we were going to seek herd immunity and then the official policy was that we were going to uh, lock down. The official excuse for lockdown was to um, uh, flatten the curve but not to stop the virus in its track. And then the official explanation for lockdown effectively became to try and extinguish the virus and so on. And so we saw a lot of scientists put in a position where they were given very strong bully pulpits, if not more, to bully politicians into taking decisions that were, you know, in the UK, we had a committee called SAGE, Scientific Advisory Group on Epidemi Epidemiology, which uh, uh, was handing down pronouncements like, um, uh, you know, the prophets of old. And it's, it's entire um, remit was how do we stop the virus spreading, okay? It wasn't charged with how do we stop the virus spreading while not crushing the economy, causing mass um, uh, unemployment, causing huge psychological problems uh, and, you know, creating other uh, side effects. So it was able to say, no, no, we're just giving advice on how to stop the virus. But if the politicians said, well, I think Sage is wrong on that because um, they haven't taken into account the side effects of that policy, then the journalist would come straight back. Ah, so you're trying to question the science, are you? And this happened yeah. again and again and again. And I, th I think it was a, um, uh, I think we have 
tested the limits of technocracy uh, in this pandemic, and it's time we, we, we rethought it. And that's not to criticise the individual scientists. They did a, as good a job as they could, the model as accepted, where I have criticisms that I voiced earlier. You know, there are some fantastic scientists doing fantastic work to try and understand this thing. But a democracy is where you have to weigh all the possibilities, not just listen to one voice. So I, I know you've got uh, just a little bit of time left, and I want to I want to go to the epilogue because I, I would imagine one of the frustrating things about writing a book on this subject is that things have already changed since you went to press. Absolutely. And and you talk about there's this quote at the end about burden tennis and how the burden of proof <laughs> is passed back and forth. Um, where are you today? Because when I when I look at uh, Alina's uh, 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 Twitter account. She seems to be uh, pretty close to being in the camp that this was at least a lab leak and it's starting to look more like a manipulated uh, super virus. Where, where are you today if you were publishing your book today? Both Alina and I say we haven't got dispositive definitive evidence for either hypothesis. There's nothing that, that proves either hypothesis. But both of us now say we lean towards the lab leak theory. We think it's more likely than, than the other. Since the book came out, as you say, stuff has, has emerged. Uh, in particular, there was a new virus found in Laos that's slightly more closely related to SARS-CoV-2 than any previous virus. And given that that's not in China, a lot of people thought, ah, right. So if bats are flitting around in Laos with a very closely related virus, then maybe that the fact that one was taken to the freezer in Wuhan from elsewhere, that is previously the closest related one, um, is less suspicious. Uh, but then a couple of weeks after that, there was a leaked document showing that the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, had um, applied for a grant to do work in Laos, among other countries, and was planning to send any viruses it found to, guess where, Wuhan. Uh, and when I pointed this out uh, yesterday, the EcoHealth Alliance uh, tweeted, ah, but we didn't do that. We never did that. We never took viruses from Laos to, to Wuhan. Um, uh, you're wrong. Um, whereupon Alina and I replied, then how come this particular entry in a genetic database of a virus collected in Laos um, by the Wuhan, by the EcoHealth Alliance, uh, and deposited at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, he says otherwise, since when there's been silence from the Health Alliance on Twitter. So, you know, it's ongoing. We're, we're, and, and, you know, it might, you know, there's a database with 22,000 entries in it at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which shows every virus they've ever collected, as far as we can tell. Uh, it's not accessible. It hasn't been accessible since September 2019, before the pandemic. The purpose of building it was to help with the pandemic. It's not clear which pandemic they're waiting for before they release it or make it available to others. But if they did, and it proved that they did not have a close relative of this virus in their possession, that would be very useful information for us and for them. So why won't they release it? Yeah, I mean, it. it's obviously incredibly suspicious and and since American taxpayers finance at least part of that research, it's it's outrageous. Correct. It's yeah. outrageous that we don't have access to that. Um, so let's let's wrap it up there. And uh, as far as I can tell, your your book is going like hotcakes. Uh, it's a bestseller already. Um, I don't know what a definition of a bestseller is, but it's certainly taking off on Amazon and elsewhere. So we're very pleased with the sales, not because we want to, you know, become famous or make a ton of money. Um, we're going to give half the proceeds to charity anyway, but because uh, we think it's a really important story, we want the world to have a decent conversation about it, and we've tried to write the most responsible book on the topic that we can. And I, I think for the sake of science, we should all become amateur experts and and make sure that, that we hold these institutions accountable. I agree. Thank you, Matt. This has been a lot of fun. Great to talk to you, Matt. That was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty. 
Honest conversations with interesting people. 